Hello everyone, welcome back to another video on the channel. This is going to be the Rapid Internal Medicine View, Episode 2. I brought to you by Gamma AI and Manus AI Combination. This is all for educational purposes, only for trainees and people with license to practice, not medical advice. We're going to do these 20, actually I reduce it to 18 because there's a lot more on each slide. And I'm going to make the notes available for free on my Patreon channel for you to download. So let's go. Biodysplastic syndrome, very important. When you see an elderly patient with multiple unexplained cytopenias on the CBC, you look at the peripheral blood smear, you may find macrocytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and then you may start thinking about getting a bone marrow biopsy. But I want you to remember MDS, which is macrocytic anemia, 50%, decrease in neutrophils by 50%, scar split is about 25%. Remember that. Next, Achalasia on special cancer. Remember that actually is basically the impaired LES relaxation leads to regurgitation of food and it has that bear's beak appearance on barium swallow. The long-term surveillance is crucial for the patients who've been diagnosed with achalasia 15 years plus because these patients are 10 to 33 times at higher risk for squamous cell carcinoma compared to general population. Next, postural psoriasis compared to regular psoriasis. Remember that postural psoriasis basically it presents with these sterile postules and erythematous base. You will see generalized versus localized. The localized forms can be palmoplantar and can treat with steroids locally, but sometimes may become disseminated across the body they may require biologic use cyclosporin acetaracine and remember that actually generalized postural psoriasis is a medical emergency it has about five to ten percent mortality and uh, there are triggers for this it could be pregnancy infection certain medications okay next a paranormonic effusion remember effusions that are less than one centimeter if they're even if they're septic you can treat with antibiotics usually get a one centimeter and to start doing things. So the fluid characteristic, of course, we did it with the thoracentesis, you want to remember the 377 mnemonic, pH less than 7.3, glucose less than 70, and LDH greater than 700. Very important. If there's positive gram stain, if there's a loculate effusion, these complicated effusions need to be drained within 24 hours to prevent loculation and reduce need for surgeries because as they progress, you may need to even use surgical intervention. And sometimes if the surgical intervention is contraindicated, we do the fibrinolytics for loculate effusions, but the next steps, bats or trochotomy if the drainage fails or empyema with thick peels is there. Basically, a trap lung is there. Next, rhinitis medicamentosa. When you give patients decongestants more than three to five days, which should not be used, that chronic vasoconstriction causes reduced oxygen de delivery to the mucosa and the nasal sinuses, paradoxical worsening of congestion, and it can take about two, two to six weeks for this decongestant discontinuation to and basically become resolved but you what you can do to help it is the steroids the intranasal steroids you can use fluticasone or mometasone to reduce inflammation you can taper the congestion that we're using slowly and you can add oral antihistamines for underlying allergic rhinitis next post radiation screening very important especially in nhl patients which receive a radiation to the neck and chest if they received radiation to the mesothinum there's echocardiography every five years for the cardiac screening there is annual tsh testing for the neck radiation thyroid monitoring breast cancer screening is very important also you begin eight years post treatments or at age 25 whichever is later you alternate mammogram and mri every five to six months for lung cancer is that annual ludo ct for patients who receive chest radiation particularly if the amount exceeds 30 gy or they also have additional risk factors such as in a smoking history now crusted scapies versus simple scapies what i want you to remember is the crusted scapies looks almost like psoriasis or eczema it's very disseminated it's hypertrototic crust and scales if you see it it, it just it looks terrible compared to a scabies that only happens in the wisdom pruritus so the difference is you see these usually in immunocompromised individuals hiv aids status and organ transplant recipients on immunosuppressive medications uh, unlike the simple scabies, these patients actually require multiple doses of oral ivermectin, three to seven, one to two weeks apart, in addition to the topical permethrin, which you would have used in the regular simple scabies. And of course, you need to isolate these patients, you need to clean their environment and screen for all of the close contacts. Now,
Acute rheumatic fever is a very important topic. They want you, of course, to realize that Jones criteria, right? We all know migratory polyarthritis, carditis, livelitis, skin manifestations, sydenham chorea with those specific purposeless movements. The diagnosis can be done with the preceding group A strep. So if you have a strep test that's positive or you have an ASO titer that's positive, but you need that plus two major criteria or one major plus two minor criteria now the minor criteria are the fever on trials they elevated the srcrp or increased pr interval on ecg now the prophylaxis they will ask you on this really depends on the severity of the carditis or the valvular disease so if there's no carditis you prophylax for five years or until age 21 whichever is longer and for all of these, it's going to be whichever is longer. If there's carditis with residual heart disease, 10 years or until age 21. If there is persistent valvular disease, 10 years or until age 40. And usually lifelong antibiotic prophylaxis is reserved for high-risk populations, endemic regions, multiple recurrences, or very severe valvular insufficiency, such as severe mitral regurgitation. Another topic that's very important, moving on to preoperative cardiac risk assessment. Two things I want you to know. First is what is RCRI, which is the Revised Cardiac Risk Index. That is based on Schick DRH, which is basically coronary artery disease, heart failure, cerebrovascular accidents, diabetes on insulin, renal insufficiency, Ukrainian grade and two, and high risk surgery. The, each of those gets one point. So, for example, if you have CAD, that's one point, that's 1% 1 major cardiac event risk, 2 points, 2% 2 risk, 3 points goes to 5% risk, and anything greater than 4 points, you're about 9% risk, basically, for major cardiac event related to surgery. Now, that on top of METs, which is used to assess functional capacity. So, if anyone has anything less than 4 METs, okay? which means probably they cannot climb stairs or they cannot walk briskly and have RCRI greater than 1% and they're undergoing a non-urgent, a non-cardiac surgery that is maybe intermediate to high risk, then they need to have some workup done, such as stress test or echo. Very important. Next, they want you to have a approach to dementia in elderly, which what we call DICE. It's based on describing the behavior, specifically investigating the causes, creating a management plan, evaluate effectiveness. They don't want you to jump into antipsychotic therapies because antipsychotics have black box warning for increased mortality in dementia patients and are reserved only if there are behaviors that pose safety risks. Okay. Usually you go at the lowest possible dose, for example, risperidone 0.25 or 0.5 milligram or quite a 12.5 to 25 milligrams. You regularly assess these patients every month and attempt to discontinue these agents every three to six months to minimize the adverse effects. Next, HIV opportunistic infection prophylaxis. Very important for PCP 200 Bactrim. Toxoplasmosis, remember CD4 100. Histoplasma, less than 150 plus endemic region. They need to be that Ohio Mississippi River for them to require itraconazole. But remember that for MAC, we no longer do prophylaxis. It's not recommended because of the low incidence of MAC and the risk of macrolide resistant. Now, the next way they can trick you is when do you discontinue the, the prophylaxis? You discontinue when the CD4 count rises above the threshold for that specific infection for at least three months with sustained viral suppression on an antiretroviral therapy. All right, simple versus uh, complex renal cyst is very tricky. Usually a category one cysts are simple, thin-walled, no septation, no solid component or calcifications. You don't require any follow-up or intervention. Category two may have thin septations, minimal calcifications, very rolex, usually not to worry about. But when you get category two F, which has, this is the keyword, multiple thin septations or minimal wall thickening, now you require imaging every six to 12 months for at least five years to monitor for the progression anything in three and four categories for these cysts you basically have increased risk of malignancy by 50 percent if it's four is greater than 90 percent so you start thinking about surgical intervention now for anything in category four you definitely need to do surgical management okay A1C interpretation, very important. They want you to know conditions that extend the RBC lifespan or reduce 
new RBST formation. So what are those conditions? Iron deficiency anemia, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, alcoholism, splenectomy, they lead to higher proportion of older cells. So then you have falsely elevated A1C. Now, con there are conditions that can shorten RBC lifespan or increase new RBC production. Those are hemolysis, blood loss, EPO use. These conditions have higher proportion of younger cells. So then they have a falsely decreased A1C. For patients that have these conditions that can affect their RBC turnover, you need to have alternative ways to check their glycemic state. So those markers could be fructosamine or glycated albumin. But remember, those also have a shorter period. So the glycemic control, for example, for that would be about two to three weeks and they can be affected by the liver function. Next, multiple sclerosis. They want you to know the McDonald's criteria, which basically means for earlier MS diagnosis using MRI. So MRI demonstrating the dissemination in time and in space. Dissemination in time it means two subsequent MRIs. You have two imaging. There's temporal relationship. Space means two different areas. For example, you have preventricular layer, juxtacortical layer, infratentorial layer, or spinal cord area before even a second clinical attack occurs. That can be diagnosed now in patients with a single clinically isolated syndrome you need the csf oligoclonal bands plus the mri legions just fulfilling the dissemination space we don't need the temporal dissemination in time for those patients so very important to know about the csf oligoclonal bands in patients with one clinically isolated syndrome or incident the legions again age about 15 to 50 Lermit sign is with a shock like feeling down the spine i know internuclear ophthalmoplegia optic neuritis these are characteristic symptoms and other conditions you have to exclude now let's go to graves disease very important to know for or ophthalmopathy related to graves disease smoking cessation is very crucial okay radioactive iron is contraindicated in mother to severe ophthalmopathy it's also contraindicated in pregnancy methimazole is the drug of choice uh, for general population ptu is preferred in first trimester pregnancy and thyroidectomy is used in pregnancy usually second trimester if the patient has large goitre with compressive fluid or when they're high risk for malignancy okay Next, cardiac risk congestion or CRT. They want you to know these specific numbers. Systolic dysfunction with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35%. AQRS complex greater than 150 milliseconds with LBB. This is the class 1 indication. If they have NYHA class 2 to 4 symptoms. If they have a, a conducted QRS with LBB morphology. If their heart rhythm is sinus, that's ideal. Reduce QRS threshold between 130 to 149 still is beneficial if they have LBB and they need to be on optimal medical therapy to receive CRT. And CRT is the biventricular pacing system with leads position right atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle via coronary sinus. Next, osteoporosis in men. We all know everything about osteoporosis in women, but remember, men greater than equal to age 70 or 50 to 69 with risk factors should be screened with DEXA scan. And what are the risk factors in men? The hypogonadism, glucocorticoid use, specifically 5 mg at least prednisone or equivalent greater than 3 months, daily alcohol use greater than 2 drinks a day, hypercalciuria, vitamin D deficiency, and thin body habits with BMI in less than 20, radiologic evidence of osteopenia, these are all risk factors and the diagnosis t-score less than equal to negative 2.5 at the femoral neck total hip or lumbar spine or the presence of a fragility fracture all right next very high yield mppv basically mppv is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation so cpap or bipap usually you start using this if there's respiratory distress with respiration regular 25 with hypoxemia spo2 less than 90 percent use a bipap if there's also a concomitant hypercapnia now NPPV has shown to reduce mortality in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema by 47%. They have shown to reduce intubation rate by 50%. They have shown to reduce ICU length of stay by about 33%. And they have shown to reduce hospital costs by about 32%. They will ask you about this. And how does this work? By pressure mnemonic, 
preload reduction, respiratory work decreases, expiratory pressure maintains that alveolar recruitment. It can improve the systolic blood pressure by reducing systemic venous return, unloading that left ventricle, and basically you can improve breathing but also in blood pressure. All right, guys, if you enjoyed and you stayed to the end of the video, Please don't forget to drop a like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what other concepts you want to cover. We will continue to do rapid internal medicine review. We have uh, some collaborations coming in the future with other board review sources. And we're going to continue studying every day, studying very hard. I'll see you guys on the next episode.